Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is a great one on oneness in Christ, uh, sort of a, a longer term for unity. And this lesson is entitled, The Most Convincing Proof. Let's see if you agree with that statement. This is lesson number nine in our series for December 1 of 2018. And uh, we're going to begin, as usual, with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to discuss your word with friends, to recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit with us in each of our discussions together. Be with us this week that what we read and hear and speak will be your words is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, we all sort of recognize, if we've been Adventists for any length of time, that we have assigned ourselves, well, no, I shouldn't say we have assigned ourselves. We have been given the assignment of carrying the final message to the world. The message which we call the three angels' messages found there in Revelation 14, uh, 6 through 12. But that's just a statement. Uh, and statements are good, but there's more. Uh, more important than just statements about what we believe are the changes that they make in our lives and actions. Does the world see I'm asking you out there, love, kindness, empathy, and those kinds of actions in your lives which represent God correctly? Does the world see in our church communities the oneness in Christ which we profess to believe? We got a lot of information about this, so I'm going to start with you, Carrie. Okay. The most convincing argument we can give to the world of Christ's mission is to be found in perfect unity. In proportion to our unity with Christ will be our power to save souls. That's a quote from a Bible training school with Ellen G. White, February 1, 1906, paragraph 6 to 7, Our High Calling, page 170, paragraph 4. A true lovable Christian is the most powerful argument that can be advanced in favor of Bible truth. This came from Ellen White, Review and Herald, January 14, 1904, paragraph 11. A well-ordered Christian household is a powerful argument in favor of the reality of the Christian religion, an argument that the infidel cannot gainsay. Can I interrupt for just a second? Yes. If a household is a powerful argument, how, how powerful would, an, would a whole Sabbath school class or a whole church be if we were all behaving like Jesus? Go ahead. A well-ordered Christian household is a powerful argument in favor of the reality of the Christian religion, an argument that the infidel cannot gainsay. From Patriarchs and Prophets 144, paragraph 3. A kind, courteous Christian is the most powerful argument in favor of the gospel that can be produced. Again, Selected Messages, Book 3, page 238, paragraph 4. Let us remember that a Christ-like life is the most powerful argument that can be advanced in favor of Christianity and that a cheap Christian character works more harm in the world than the character of a worldling. Wow. Again, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 21, paragraph 1. Wow, okay, well, so what about that? Does, does it impress you more to see someone actually acting Christ-like or just telling us that we should be Christ-like? There's a famous poem that was written about 100 years ago by Edgar Albert Guest that I think we should take a moment or two to think about, Margaret. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd, ra I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is a better pupil, more willing than the ear. Fine, con fine counsel is confusing, but example always clear. And the best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds, for to see good put in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do if you will let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. <laughs> and what the fact that happened. <laughs> yeah. And the lecture you deliver may, very may be very wise and true, 
but I'd rather get my lesson by observing what you do. For I might misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. When I see a deed of kindness, I am eager to be kind. When a weaker brother stumbles and a strong man stays behind just to see if he can help him, then the wish grows strong in me to become as big and thoughtful as I know that friend to be. And all travelers can witness that the best of guides today is not the one who tells them, but the one who shows the way. One good man teaches many. Men believe what they behold. One deed of kindness noticed is worth forty that are told. Who stands with men of honor learns to hold his honor dear, for right living speaks a language which to everyone is clear. Though an able speaker charms me with his eloquence, I say I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Very good. That's a famous poem that was well known many years ago. Not so many uh, remember it anymore. Is that really a hundred years old? Close to it. Wow. Really? Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was that old. So where does this spiritual unity we're talking about, now where does it come from? Do we just get a group of people like us here and decide to work together and we just sort of come up with unity? It comes from the Spirit. Uh, Ephesians 4 says, be eager to preserve the unity of the Spirit. Okay. Which is, of course, he, uh, the Spirit brings us Christ. So, so now we he's, our fo he's our focal point. Okay. We struggle with receiving the gifts of the Spirit, even individually, how would a group receive a, a, the gift of the Spirit? Any idea? Years ago, I heard about an experiment that was done at a summer camp, and they divided the camp into two groups and set about having rival, uh, rival games and everything, and distension grew and grew between the two groups. And then they created a situation with the water supply that needed all, lots of hands and they all started working on this one project together and that began to heal the dissension mm -hmm. that was between the two groups. So we all need to be focused on, on the same thing, which of course is Jesus, but uh, it's through the Spirit that we have access to. Very good. And I mean, you, you've, we've all seen this many times. Children in a family can fight and carry on something, but if someone attacks the family, they're all standing side by side and they're defending their family, you know? And, and we need, to, this is a lesson we need to learn because in churches, small groups are the key to seeing a church really grow and, and do things. Small groups that get together and say, well, what can we do? Can we hold a picnic? Can we do uh, some kind of a public uh, you know, benefit program? Can we do whatever, whatever, whatever? And those kind of things just act like magnets to people. Um, anyway, I, I spoke my piece now. <laughs> but you know, small groups, it's not just church. Yeah, no. I think of our Lopers Running Club the key to their success for 42 years mm -hmm. is that tight-knit group around a certain pace group mm -hmm. that do things together. Yep. Dennis, I think you've got some words from Jesus himself and then from Paul. Yes, uh, John 11, 51 and uh, 2. Actually, he did not say this on his own accord. Rather, he, as he was high priest that year... I wish I'd interrupt for a second. This is the words of... He's getting ready to quote the words of Caiaphas. Right. Mm -hmm. oh, he just right. finished quoting the word Caiaphas. Go ahead. Right. Um, actually, he did not say this of his own accord. Rather, as he was high priest that year, he was prophesying that Jesus was going to die for the Jewish people, and not only for them, but also to bring together into one body all the scattered people of God. And that's the Good News uh, translation. Very good. And then Ephesians 1 seven through ten. For by the blood of Christ are we, uh, are we set free, that is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God which he gave to us in such a large measure. 
in all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had proposed and made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth, with Christ as head. Also Good News Bible. Okay, so now we need to think about what we've just heard. How does forgiving our sins set us free? Oh, lifts a load off your shoulders and your, okay. especially your mind. <laughs> okay. You say, thank you, Lord. Yeah. It's an attitude. You're willing to accept the forgiveness instead of yeah. just keep beating yourself up. And um, how long has God been forgiving? Has he just been forgiving since the cross? He's always been forgiving. God has always been forgiving. So now... Ellen White says that there's an atmosphere of grace surrounding the mm -hmm. earth as, as real as the air we breathe, and I think that's part of that. So, um, yeah, so now you know where I'm going to go next. So how does what happened on Crucifixion Weekend set us free? Is it, we, we've talked about lifting the load of sin. Is there anything more of that to that, more to it than that? I think that's a mystery, really. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, no, it's a no, mystery why that works. Yeah. Okay. Well, to, uh, I, I've said many times, Jesus came as a teacher. The duty of a parent is to teach the kids. Uh, he's, Jesus says, I'll teach you how to pray, our Father who art in heaven. And so he came as a teacher, and of course, then you get to Romans 3.25, and the proper translation, his, his death was to bring peace goes to demonstrate the truth about God. Mm -hmm. Four t or three times it says that in, in uh, Romans 3, 25 and 26. Yeah. But unfortunately, many, in fact, most translations have this business of a propitiation, which is purely made up, is not, should not be in the Bible, shouldn't be part of the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus did not need to push, propitiate the wrath of, of anybody, and especially the Father. Yeah. So. Now, okay. I, I sort of set you up for a trap now. Are you ready? <laughs> because it says this plan, I'm just reading the last sentence there, this plan which God will complete when the time is right is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth with Christ as head. Now, we are set free because our sins are forgiven. What about the angels and the rest of the universe? What does it do for them? Yes, Jackie. In the great controversy, it says that when a third of the angels got cast out of heaven, uh -huh. thrown down to earth, that there were angels up there that still had some questions and reservations. They weren't sure how this is all going to work out. Uh -huh. And when Christ was crucified and laid down his life and suffered the second death, yeah. all questions were answered. Mm -hmm. The universe no longer had questions. Yeah, that's almost true, not quite true. Well. But no, very good, you did a good job. If you want to read about that, where it specifically comments what you, on what you just said, it's the chapter, it is finished in the book, Desire of Ages. Oh, wrong book, sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> Desire of Ages, chapter is written in Desire of Ages. And it's, she just says in there, while they still had questions, uh, a few questions, yeah. most have been answered. So what kind of questions were answered that could set the universe right? What kind of questions were answered by the death of Jesus? The well. accusations that Satan made about the character of God, mm -hmm. that God was arbitrary, that he was severe, that he was judgmental, that he was that question was answered with the death of Jesus. Okay, and there's one huge question that hangs over the Christian world to this day that was answered decisively by Jesus. What was it? You can't die. Satan said, if you sin, God said, if you sin, you will die. And Satan mm -hmm. said, you won't die. And Jesus says, watch me. I will take sin upon myself on the cross he did not die of crucifixion. He didn't die of the beatings. He didn't die of the nails in his hands. He died of sin. He's the only one in the history of our world so far that actually have died a direct result. Now, we, 
we know about the collateral effects of sin. All kinds of people die as a collateral effects of sin, but Jesus died of sin. So we have a demonstration now. We have the choice. We can, we can choose to live as Jesus lived, or we will die the way he died, separated from God. That's, that's what that's all about. And you could, even though that poem uh, that was read is kind of about us, mm -hmm. I'd rather uh, see a sermon than hear one, uh, just God telling us about himself is not as much of an impact as actually as demonstrating no. uh, that logic. Yeah. Well, Jackie, I'm going to ask you to pick up your verse there, Ephesians 3. Oh. <coughs> Ephesians 3, 7 to 10. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, which he gave me through the work of his power. I am less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages, in order that at this present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. Okay, now you know what question I'm going to ask now. What can the angels and rulers and powers, or whatever you choose to call them, living in the universe, the universe, what could they possibly learn about God from us? I mean, they're living there with God. They can walk over and ask him a question anytime. They see how he behaves every day, all day long. So, we are living in this sinful planet. What do they learn about God from us? Well, we, they see more real life demonstrated uh, it, rather than just telling, it, they have, remember, what was it, First Corinthians 4, 9, this earth is a theater stage for all the heavenly intelligences. Mm -hmm. So sometimes uh, you have to you have something, a story you want to tell. You tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. Well, people get to see in real life how, how that works out. Yeah. And uh, you don't, it, God doesn't have to use intimidation, coercion, extortion, oppression, <laughs> he just has to demonstrate. And by the way, he never explained what the efficacy was of his death. There's no place and you can find in the Bible that, that will explain what, why he was going to die. He just says, I'm going to die. Kind of a mystery. In fact, I will lay down my life and I will take it up again. You aren't even, those that are out to kill me, aren't even get, have the uh, pleasure, quotes, <laughs> of killing me. You can't take my life. Mm -hmm. That's one way of looking at it anyway. Yes, Jeff. I'm glad, Carrie, you were. I was just going to say, I, I th think the universe would be looking on from the creation of Adam and Eve and mm -hmm. seeing the degradation that we're living under today. I mean, it's, it's just tragic what has happened. Yeah. And they see where it leads finally. Well, and it, that's true, but I think it, this is probably at least the second go around. We got the war in heaven, uh, they, yes, all, and, yes. and God never killed anybody then. And uh, he's, he's, that shows how, you, we talk about love, but I don't think love has really been properly defined by most people. They think it's some feeling you have or whatever. No, every intelligent creature has to have the capacity to demonstrate what their character is. And we have the story in Revelation 12, uh, that there was a third of them were, were involved in the war, but the other two thirds heard the yeah. fal uh, false charges uh, by the adversary, and uh, this is what, what they get to learn further. I, go ahead. Thing oh, uh, Jackie was going to go first. I'll, I'll let her go first, and then it's your turn. Here. I won't forget mine. You can go. <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> well, what Carrie mentions, things look pretty bad. This isn't the first time. Yeah. Things look pretty bad when God had to destroy the earth with water. Yeah. Yeah. Think of what the universe looked at then. Yeah. Seven or eight human beings <sighs> as a result of 
drowning everyone. Well, there's another way of looking at that. Mm. He may not have destroyed the earth. The earth got destroyed, but God provided a way of escape. A way of escape. Yeah. I mean, he, in, his yeah, in, for, in his yeah, in for in his foreknowledge. Small group. Well, they weren't all that great. They <laughs> no. did. They just climbed on the boat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so. yeah, I don't want to get too far away from your comment. Have you ever worked in a really busy place and the place has fallen down around your ears and the boss shows up and they start, I want you to do this, go get and go do this and go do that and they won't get off of their butt and actually help you with some hands and some feet action. Yeah. Our God, he gets his hands dirty. Yeah. He gets down in that latrine ditch and he starts digging. And I think this world is so dark and has become so awful. The fact that he even shows up is just a miracle to me. But to stand side by side with you, to come into my heart that is dirty, mm -hmm. to want to make it clean. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful amazing, thing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Which is the other thing that the universe is seeing. They saw what God would do and they might say, well, yes, I'll worship this God, but what about these people? What, what are we going to do with them? You yeah. know, to see the transformation yeah. from sin to righteousness uh, working in our lives. Another incredible part of that Crucifixion Weekend story that many people don't even think about unless you've carefully read Patriarchs and Prophets, Desire of Ages and Great Controversy, is this. And Jesus himself said this, but you, unless you know the whole story behind it, it doesn't, doesn't immediately come to your, to your attention. He said, of course, that sin leads to death. Satan claimed in heaven that he stood on one side of God's throne and Jesus was on the other side of God's throne. And we know that Jesus took on the title of Michael, M Michael the Archangel. He moved among the angels as, a, as if he were an angel. And so Satan, Lucifer at that time, said, well, why should Jesus be considered different than I am? I mean, he acts like an angel, I'm an angel, we should both be equal. And that was part of the argument that got started, and that's part of what started the whole argument. And then you see that in the, in the Pharisees or Sadducees that, uh, well, you know, how is it that you, being a mere man, make yourself out to be God? You, yeah. know, you look just like us. Yeah, exactly. Why are well, you different? Well, the, the rest of this story is on Sunday morning, very early, God says, you know that Satan had tried three ways. He said, when Jesus was born as a child, Satan said, I'm going to get him to sin. There's no person who's lived on this earth yet that survived without sinning. I'm going to get this kid to sin. He failed. So finally, he said, as he got near the end of his ministry, he said, if I can't get him to sin, I'm going to make his life so tough, so difficult. He won't, don't, not, I'm not going to make him sin. I mean, if I can't make him sin, I'm going to make him give up and just go back to heaven. Mm -hmm. And he failed on that one too. So then he said, well, now that he's dead, I'm going to keep him in the grave. And the Zyre of Ages said there were two angels came from heaven. She says, Satan and his entire host were surrounding that grave to keep it closed. And when those two angels showed up, there was nothing they could do. They just scattered. The, and Satan and his entire host just scattered. We talk about the hundred soldiers that were struck dead, sort of, at there. I mean, that was nothing. We're talking about Satan's entire host. They knew that if that grave came open and Jesus came out of there, it was all over for them. And so one angel rolled back the stone, and the other angel said, Jesus, your father calls you. And Zarbage says very clearly, I believe it's page 785, he came forth in, within the, with the power that was within himself. In other words, he, turned, he could have turned to Satan and said, let's see if you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so that was another, I mean, a clear demonstration that he wasn't just a human being. And, that's, that's, and very distinct from, from Satan. So Jim, Ellen White has something to say about that as well. To the angels and the unfallen worlds, the cry, it is finished, had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. They will, excuse me, they will, <laughs> they with us share the fruits of Christ's victory. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 758. But now they did not have, need to have their sins forgiven because we're talking about the good angels here. So what did they need? Well. 
Look at these verses from Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. So he wants you to understand that when he was walking here on earth with his feet dirty and his clothes dirty and looking awful and so forth and maybe hungry, he was still God. Through the Son then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's blood on the cross and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. So we still have to struggle with the question, what exactly did the death of Jesus do for the rest of the universe? Remove doubt. Okay, answer the doubt, questions. If I yeah. doubt somebody, you know, even the slightest, there is some sense of separation, you yeah. know, or standoffishness and so. Well, Caiaphas, who started this discussion that we've been talking about here, clearly thought that Jesus needed to be eliminated in order to prevent the total destruction of their system that they had worked out with the Roman government. He saw that if people believed and acted on what Jesus taught, their system would be finished. So John, quoting Caiaphas, understood the statement as a much larger context. So we need to ask ourselves, how does the life and death of Jesus bring the entire universe into harmony once again? Well, the questions are answered. If you, if you have any questions about God and his behavior, what kind of character he has, just look at the life of Jesus. Those questions are all answered right there. Now, our Bible study guide suggests, and by the way, for, for those of you who might want to use these uh, or, or study these materials that we put together, they're available on our website under the Sabbath School section uh, our website is theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you can get these materials that, that we study here together. The Bible study guide says our foundational message is that Jesus died so that we can be saved. I would say in light of what we've just gone through, it's much bigger than that. It was not just for that that Jesus died, God is bringing the entire universe back into harmony through the death of his son. What does the death of Jesus do for the beings in the rest of the universe? It answers the questions and the accusation that they have heard repeated by Satan again and again and again and again down through history. So, remember, and we need to, well, we need to, always need to keep this in mind, those accusations didn't start here on planet Earth. Those accusations were made while he was standing next to God in heaven before this world that we know was even created. Well, by being baptized as members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we realize that we are part of a group that is commissioned to work together to finish the gospel on this earth under the direction and power of the Holy Spirit. Whatever dif differences we may perceive culturally, socially, ethnically, or politically, nothing is supposed to stop us from accomplishing that ultimate goal. Sometimes people give you the impression that, well, if they were just, if they just had the Holy Spirit working, and you can hear this on TV all the time, the TV evangelists, if the Holy Spirit would just give me his power, I would finish the gospel. What are they saying? They're saying they're smarter than God, right? challenge. <laughs> Smarter than God? I don't think so. <laughs> There's no shortcuts that yeah. God can use. So we need, we need all the people, all the languages, all the cultures, all the whatever. We need people from all those different environments to be speaking the word, the truth about God at one time. So um, there's a lot of conflicts. Someone just told me, what was that, today? Maybe it was yesterday, that there's 76 wars going on right now. 76? 76 wars going on right now. The United States has been at war for well over 100 years, yeah. without, literally without oh. stop. Yeah, oh yeah. Not, not as a whole nation, but in one way or another, helping this one or helping that one and whatever, yeah. We're supposed to be the... Uh, well, that was... The economy of what Nineveh was was war. What's the economy of the, of the United States? Yeah, that's part of it. 
Look at Ephesians 2, 13 to 16. As soon as I can get my computer to wake up here, we'll have a look at that. But now in union with Christ Jesus, you, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought us peace by making uh, Jews and Gentiles one people. With his own blood, own body, I'm sorry, he broke down the wall that separated them and kept them enemies. He abolished the Jewish law, and that's not really what it says there. With his commandments, it's talking about the law of separation. Uh, in order to create out of the two races one new people in union with himself, in this way making peace. By his death on the cross, Christ destroyed their enmity. By means of the cross, he united both races into one body and brought them back to God. Well, I, there's another passage that probably spells that out even more detail. You want to read that for us, Kerry? Sure. It comes from the Good News Bible translation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. Anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. Our message is that God was making the whole human race his friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins, and he has given us the message which tells how he makes them his friends. Here we are, then, speaking for Christ as though God himself were making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. Let God change you from enemies into his friends. Christ was without sin, but for our sake God made him share our sin in order that in union with him we might share the righteousness of God. Wow. Amen. So what do you think it means when it says God wants to make, change us from enemies into friends? What do, what do you think the people who, Paul writing it, and then the people who received that book of Romans, what do you think they understood when he said, let God change you from enemies into friends. Is that too big a... Don't live in rebellion to God. Okay. With God. And God's he, not after you no, to destroy no. you. He's mm -hmm. welcoming you into friendship with Him. Yeah. I see Jesus and me walking down a beach together. Mm. Just the two of us talking. You know there's a story about that. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a famous sermon, sermon illustration. One guy supposedly saw a vision of, of Jesus in the nighttime. He and a friend, he and Jesus, walking down the beach, and he while they're walking down the beach, oh, well, he 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 sees the past, and so now he goes back and he's looking, and he's watching the footprints, yeah. and all of a sudden they come to a rough spot, and there's just one set of footprints, and he says to Jesus, "How come? How come? You 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 gave up on me? You left me alone here through the tough part." And you said, no, I was carrying you mm -hmm. through the yeah. tough part. Yeah. That's a great story. Well, we understand that we have been called to be the remnant community of Christians who will live through the final days of this earth's history. We're the farthest of any generation from the tree of life. We're weak and mortal as, as much as we could be, probably. In order, so in order to live through those final conflicts with all the forces of the devil against us. We must not only be united in our beliefs and practices relative to God, but also in our unity and love toward our fellow church members. Okay? So how does that work out? Does, if, we, if, God, if God makes us his friends, or if we are made his friends, somehow or other, through the death, life and death of Jesus, how does that affect our relationship with other church members specifically? We're members one of, an, of each other. You know, we are mm -hmm. part of the body of Christ. Christ is the head and we are the members, as Paul uses in another illustration in 1 Corinthians. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, be part of one another. Jesus himself, in that upper room, just before they went out toward the Garden of Gethsemane, said these words, If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Mm -hmm. How does that work? I mean, is it really possible that if we're true Christians, 
true loving Christians, we will stand out from everybody else around? Well, it did in the early church. Acts records that phenomenon. It wouldn't apply to us. It can apply to us by faith. It should apply to us, I would like to say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> but sometimes the policies and the practice in our organized church seems to polarize us into yeah. two groups. Yeah. But we still have to, even if you somehow are tempted to believe of the other side is the enemy, we still have to love them. Mm -hmm. uh, as Christ said, you know, it, if you only li love those who love you, uh, love you, what is that? Even the, yeah. the you know, the Gentiles do that. But even love the taxpayers, those, yeah, tax collectors. Love those who persecute you, do good to those who, uh, I don't remember the full text, but yeah, you okay. kind of get the gist. Mm -hmm. Well, again, so now the life and death of Jesus has answered the questions in the Great Controversy. We know that God is not the kind of person, Margaret mentioned that a little bit earlier, we know that he's not the kind of person the devil has tried to portray him as being, you know, arbitrary and vengeful and unforgiving and severe and exacting and all those other terrible things, a tyrant. And so we should, be, we should feel more comfortable with him. And that, that level of comfort should spill over in the way we relate to others around us. God has told the truth. The devil has lied to us about every important aspect down through history. Well, these angels who are watching us now, are they encouraged about God's ability to pull together a people that represent him correctly? Is the world seeing more and more of the character of God in our church, or is the devil succeeding in many churches? Well, he tried to succeed with Christ, and as you recounted, he failed in every, every measure. So we can, by faith, move forward and allow God to, to but that demonstrate wasn't, to us. That, that wasn't the question I asked. Not whether we can, but are we moving forward? Yes, uh, I think so. Well, I hope so. If I take my eyes off of Jesus and start looking around, seeing how you're doing and you're doing, and mm -hmm. I'm lost right there. Mm -hmm. I just keep focused on Him. And by faith, He's going to walk me every day down that beach, mm -hmm. and we are going to make it. Mm -hmm. So I don't really have, I don't know that, I don't like that question. <laughs> you, don't, you don't really have to worry. Exactly. You don't have to worry. In yeah. a world of sin, yeah. criticism is the easiest job there is. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> ain't it the truth? Find something well, in almost everybody. Yeah. I think we as a church are beginning to take more use of the, of the facets of science, for want of a better term, than we've ever done. Yes, we use radio, we've used TV, but we've branched out much wider. Mm -hmm. And and it's uh, it's coming from up top, too, It's mm -hmm. if, if you really look into it. Well, Carrie, I think you're next here. No, no it's Mark. I am. I'm yeah. sorry. What Christ? What Christ was in his life on this earth what every Christian is to be. He is our example, not only in his spotless purity, but in his patience, gentleness, and winsomeness of disposition. It's from Ellen G. White, Science of the Times, July 16, 1902, paragraph Whoa. three. Wow, is that possible? Or is that an impossible? It's just a go away off somewhere there. We need to move toward it, but we'll never get there. <laughs> like the say, the saying that she wrote, uh, you know, with, with the reception of the Holy Spirit, heaven begins yeah, uh, here, at huh? that point. So, uh, with with our choice to to follow Him and and let Him work in our hearts, that becomes a reality. We might stumble and fall here. Or okay, there, look at a okay. Look at a couple of verses. Philippians 2, verse 5. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God and so forth, which we don't have. But then, 
Look at this incredible verse in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Imitate me then just as I imitate Christ. Mm -hmm. So Paul apparently thought it was possible. I don't know how you could interpret that any other way. And I, I do believe that God inspired him to say those words. Or, in the ways that I imitate Christ, imitate me. Mm -hmm. But anything that doesn't fit that bill, forget about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, <laughs> Paul didn't hesitate to point out the problems that he observed in the churches that he helped to start. Things like, and, and the, if you can look at Ephesians 4, verse 25 through 5, verse 2, and Colossians 3, 1 to 17, I just picked out some of the things it mentions there. Lying, anger, robbing, evil speaking, making God's Holy Spirit sad, bitterness, passion, hateful feelings. Those things can't be a part of God's end time people. They just can't be. These do not represent lives patterned after Jesus. He strongly warned against sexual immorality, he goes on, indecency, lust, evil passions, and greed. And then he went on to spell out how these things are to be replaced by Christ's message, love, kindness, forgiving others, etc. What a contrast. Wow. Well, similar sentiments are represented elsewhere in the New Testament. Think of the golden rule. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as one example. Uh, here's another one, Galatians 6, verse 2. Help to carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will obey the law of Christ. Carrying one another's burdens. Um, anyway, do we correctly understand the impact our lives are having on those around us? Or do we try to pretend that, this is my life, I can live the way I want to. It's none of your business. We probably don't think about that very much, mm -hmm. the impact our lives have on those around us. We're so self-centered. We, we, we live in a world that has almost no idea about the character of God. And there's also a sense in which disinterested benevolence doesn't look for well, did this work? Or, I mean, you, yes, you, you want some sense that, but if you know what the right thing to do is, you do it irregardless of the, <laughs> the, what happens in, in response. Mm -hmm. A unified church living out lives like the life of Jesus Christ would stand out like an incredible light in the world. Are we doing that? I hope in some places <coughs> we are. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, if every... Christian, and here's my question for you out there. If every Christian were doing just what you are doing to advance the gospel by representing Christ to those around you, how soon would the gospel be finished? Good question. But Paul, having traveled around the Mediterranean world, recognizing that there were considerable diversity, even in that area was considerable diversity to which Christianity had to adapt itself, came up with some Challenging ideas. Look at Romans 14, 1 to 6. As soon as I can find out where my cursor is, there we go. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but do not argue with them about their personal opinions. Now, what qualifies as a personal opinion? Some people's faith allows them to eat anything, but the person who is weak in the faith eats only vegetables. So obviously, I'm weak in the faith because that's what I've been eating all my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, what does this mean? Those who will eat anything are not to despise those who don't, while those who eat only vegetables are not to pass judgment on those who will eat anything, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? That's an interesting approach. Mm -hmm. It is their own master who will decide whether they succeed or fail, and they will succeed because the Lord is able to make them succeed. Some people think that a certain day is more important than other days, while others think that all days are the same. And now he's going to say, and of course you have to keep the seven-day Sabbath, right? He said, no, we should each firmly make up our own minds. Whoa! Did he just throw out the whole Ten Commandments? Well, I mean, if you just took that one verse, let every man be firmly convinced in his own mind, you and use that as a template for everything else, 
But Paul isn't giving them license to do whatever they want. He's talking about these these narrow things that there's certain disputes about. Well, and what were some of those? Well, we already mentioned some. The, the argument, and just to very briefly review that, there were three or four main roads that came into Corinth. And each one of those roads was lined with temples to pagan gods. And it was expected as you brought your goods in to sell, and mainly it was alcohol and, and animal products, meat primarily, you were expected to stop at at least one of those temples and give a portion to the temple god, which is, which is a way of saying that the whole load was dedicated that t to that god. So then when you got into the, the central square where the marketplace was, if someone came along and bought a piece of that meat and took it home and ate it, it was assumed that he would get the blessing from that God. Now, what is Paul saying to us here? He's saying, if you had a chance to read the whole, all of Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8 and 10, he's saying, look, we who are really Christian and understand what the gospel is all about know perfectly well that whatever those so-called gods are made out of, whether it's metal or stone or wood or whatever, they do not affect the food in any way. So if, you, if there's something in the marketplace that you need to eat, this is not talking about whether it's healthy, but if there's something in the marketplace that, that you think you would like to eat and it's appropriate, then you don't need to worry about which God it was offered to. Okay? So some felt free to eat anything they found in the meat market. Others did not. They ate only vegetables. Paul, and, and fortunately for us, and fortunately for Daniel back in his day, the gods didn't like vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can eat the vegetables and not have to worry about them being offered to some foreign god. They, that included how they treated certain special religious feasts as well as fasting. Those were regarded as very important by conservative Jews. You know, there were, if you go back to Leviticus, there were a whole collection of like once a month and other things, that th these smaller religious festivals. And, and Paul is saying, some of you may think those things are really important, but those aren't a big deal. If, someone, if you want to think they're important, that's fine. Do your thing. But don't look down on somebody else because he doesn't observe it the way you do. Well, some people felt in those days that in order to be a Christian, to be a real Christian, you had to be a Jew first. You had to follow all the Jewish ceremonies, all the Jewish practices, including circumcision, of course. But Paul, having been a Pharisee of the Pharisees, more clearly discerned what was really important, what was not. So in our day, what kinds of things that are not really that important might divide churches? A host of things. Come on now. What do you mean a host of things? That couldn't happen in Adventist yeah. churches, could people, it? People like this and other people don't. I mean, we can just pick a few, just very simple things. Some people abhor the idea of wearing a wedding ring. And they think it's terrible. Other people don't think I that's any one. big deal. Yeah. I want everybody to know I belong to this wonderful man that, here. That's great. <laughs> How about purple hair? Yeah, exactly. I'd like to dye mine and spike it like his. Well, what, what, about, <laughs> what about a vegetarian diet? Others people feel even today they're comfortable eating meat. Some Christian groups are very concerned about styles and about the length of women's dresses, and others don't think that's a big deal. And the list could go on and on, as Dennis already pointed out. So what do we learn from the example of the disciples that might be a warning to us or an encouragement to us? Margaret, I think that's yours. Is it? No, it's mine. Oh, it's yours. I'm sorry. Okay, Luke 22, 24. An argument broke out among the disciples as to which one of them should be thought of as the greatest. And I should interrupt there just a second. When was that argument taking place? Last Supper. As they were entering the room where they were going to participate in the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. They gathered frequently to pray as a group together with the women and with Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. That's Acts 1.14. Then when the day of Pentecost came, all the believers were gathered together in one place. Day after day they met as a group in the temple, and they had their meals together in their homes, eating with glad and humble hearts, praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. That's Acts 2. 
to one in 46 to 47. Boy, something happened, huh? Think of the impact that Crucifixion Weekend had on the disciples. What brought about that incredible change? I mean, couldn't they have pointed at Peter? But look, you, you, you cussed and swore about him in, in Caiaphas' house. <laughs> and, and Thomas, you wouldn't, but you didn't believe, even though we all said we saw him, he was here, we, we, we know he's alive. Nope, I'm not going to believe until I see it myself. You know, they could have had all, I'm sure there were lots of accusations they could have made against each other, but. I think after the resurrection, all those things kind of melted away <laughs> into insignificance. <laughs> exactly. They were so excited about what had happened. <clears throat> okay, Dennis, think you're next? Yes. Um, these days of preparation were days of deep heart searching. The disciples felt their spiritual need and cried to the Lord for the holy unction that was to fit them for the work of soul saving. They did not ask for a blessing for themselves merely. They were weighted, uh, weighted, da weighted with the burden of the salvation of souls. They realized that the gospel was to be carried to the world and they claimed the power of Christ, that Christ had promised. Ellen G. White, Acts of the Apostles, page 37. Paragraph two. And Jackie, I think you have a contrasting <clears throat> comment. Yes. It's from Manuscript 21, Evangelism, page 102. Strife for the supremacy makes manifest a spirit that, if cherished, will eventually shut out from the kingdom of God those who cherish it. The peace of Christ cannot dwell in the mind and the heart of a workman who criticizes and finds fault with another workman simply because the other does not practice the methods he thinks best or because he feels that he is not appreciated. The Lord never blesses him who criticizes and accuses his brethren, for this is Satan's work. Wow. Well, we, we as Seventh-day Adventists are not the only Christians in the world. How do we, how do we relate to other Christian groups? Is there something that we can say to them and to the rest of the universe, the rest, even the rest of the people on this planet, that nobody else is saying? This, well, this we great controversy yeah. idea is kind of unique to us it's as very a unique to us. church. It seems like we have more understanding of what's all behind it. Yeah. And, it, and that's it's worth scenes. talking about. Yeah. It explains so many things in Scripture that you can't explain any other way. You, there are a lot of stories in the Old Testament that you come in. why in the world did that happen? And the only explanation is, well, there's a great controversy going on. And if you see that, oh yeah, well look, yeah, oh yeah, isn't that, oh yeah, yeah. My so, personal studies in Job this morning and yesterday, and you see the council. And mm -hmm. then they come back together. I'm not sure how long it took, yeah. but they're back with an organization mm -hmm. in the universe, and Satan represents this earth. And no one else in the world has our understanding of the great controversy. Right. So you are blessed, and we are blessed if we, if we know about those things. And we need to be telling the world about this incredible message. A correct understanding, based on our uh, a correct understanding of the great controversy and how it was divided, divided the universe will help us to reach out to others with the truth of the gospel. So what has been your experience? Have you tried to spread that idea out to others? If we insist on doing things our own way, even when we upset others by doing so, we are following the example of Satan. But if we manage to live together in harmony and in Christ-like belief and action, it is an unanswerable argument in favor of the gospel. It's just not normal for human beings to do that. It's satanic. Can you think of one or more individuals who've had an important impact on your own life because of their Christian witness and behavior? What things did you see in, in their life that still, what things do you see in your own life that still need changing? If we could have a secret camera following each one of us for the next week, how would that collective presentation fit with what God would like to see in us? I, uh, Some, something to think about. Something to think about. Mm -hmm. 
Would, do you agree that a united, harmonious, Christ-like church believing and living out the gospel would be a powerful force in the world? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So why don't we do it? What's keeping us from doing it? Spirit wars against the flesh. Oh, dear. So what does it mean to be reconciled and become friends of God? We read that passage a little earlier, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 21. What does it really mean to become God's friends? Do you think of God as your personal friend? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm asking you out there, do you think of God as your personal friend? Well, there's a passage that comes out of our Bible study guide that I've asked Jim, would you read that for us? The church is, a, is called to be an expression of this alternative society, a place where the upside down priorities of the Beatitudes operate, where service is more important than status where humility trumps hubris, where love is expressed instead of lust, and where collaboration replaces competition, as Lowell C. Cooper in Doing Justice, Loving Mercy in the End Time. That's a beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful concept. When yeah. you read that sentence, yep. that's wordsmithing. Yeah. So now I'm going to ask you a question. If you watch movies made in Hollywood, do you see that? That's, no, that's rarely. damaging to the, to the mind, especially well, religious movies from Hollywood. Yeah. It's really a distortion of, the tr of truth. The world mm -hmm. around us is just about as opposite to that idea than anything you can possibly imagine. It's just, it's scary. It's scary. An alternative society. That's us. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of beautiful. <clears throat> so could we somehow as individuals begin that transformation process that would bring us and our families and our churches and our Sabbath school classes back into harmony with God? If we could do that, there's a place waiting for us. Amen. God is waiting to take us. He's just waiting. Can you imagine how he feels after 2,000 years of waiting? I mean, I, I, we can't even imagine it. We have tr I have trouble waiting five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you've got the idea. We thank you for joining us for this time. Thank you for being with us. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to study your world, word and to think about these great ideas that expand our mind and our thinking. Help us to think of ways in which we can reach out to those around us every day to say something to them about the great controversy, which is such an important way for us to understand the issues in our world, the problems in our world, and what the solutions are. May we comprehend them well enough to be able to speak about them clearly is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.